Hello, and welcome to the State Historical Society of Iowa's Grant and Grant Writing Webinar. I am Kristen Vandermullen, the State Historical Society's Grant Manager. And I'm Lisa Kent, the Grant Writer for the Department of Cultural Affairs. The main purpose of this webinar is to teach you about the State Historical Society's grant programs and provide some grant writing tips. Before we dive into that material, it is important to understand why a funder has money available and whether or not your project or organization fits into the funder's priorities. So we are going to start with a quick overview of the department to provide context for who we are and what we do. Then we will go over our available grant programs, the grant application, and some tips for grant writing. The department empowers Iowa to build and sustain culturally vibrant communities by connecting Iowans to the people, places, and points of pride that define our state. The department impacts Iowans through the State Historical Society, the Iowa Arts Council, and Produce Iowa, which is the State Office of Media Production. The Iowa Arts Council is the arts arm of the department, and its mission is to cultivate creativity, participation, and learning in the arts. Produce Iowa is the State Office of Media Production, and its mission is to promote and facilitate media production in the state in order to develop a more sustainable, creative economy in Iowa. The State Historical Society's grant programs are the focus of this webinar. The State Historical Society has a dual mission of preservation and education. The Society preserves and provides access to Iowa's historical resources through a variety of statewide programs, exhibitions, and projects while serving as an advocate for Iowa's past and a connector to the future. All divisions administer funding, networking, and learning opportunities that support arts, history, and culture in Iowa. The primary grant program that we will discuss is the Historical Resource Development Program, which is also referred to as HRDP. HRDP and other related programs that we will discuss in this webinar are funded through the state's Resource Enhancement and Protection Program, or REAP, which invests in the enhancement and protection of the state's natural and cultural resources. REAP is funded entirely by state dollars. The State Historical Society receives 5% of the annual REAP allocation for HRDP grants. These grants are available to preserve, conserve, interpret, enhance, and educate the public about the historical resources of Iowa. The funding for HRDP is broken down into three grant categories. Iowa code allows that no category shall receive more than 60% of the annual appropriation and no category shall receive less than 20% of the funding. Based on the demand from each category, documentary collections and museums typically receive 20% each and historic preservation receives 60%. Documentary collections uh, funds projects involving two-dimensional artifacts or document collections. Another way to look at this is when the preservation is of the information contained within the resource rather than preservation of the actual object itself. Some examples would be newspapers, photographs, film, oral, and oral histories. Historic preservation projects deal with the historical resources that are part of our built environment or archaeological sites. These projects include building or site surveys, National Register nominations, and rehabilitation of buildings listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Museums projects involve the preservation, conservation, and exhibition of three-dimensional object collections. Examples of projects are cataloging, conservation surveys, treatment of collections, artifact acquisition and conservation, interpretation of collections and exhibitions. The grant round opens up in late January each year. The application deadline is mid to late April. Funded projects can get underway after July 1st. The funding period is two and a half years. 50% of the grant funds are sent at the beginning of the grant contract period, and a final report is required to close out the project and request final reimbursement. The range of eligible applicants is inclusive of nearly anyone who has a historical resource that they are responsible for maintaining. These applicant types include nonprofit corporations, governmental units at the city, county, and state level, tribal societies and governments of recognized American Indian tribes in Iowa, individuals, and for-profit businesses. The applicant does not need to own the historical resource, but must have the owner's permission to apply for the grant. 
If the applicant is a local government and applying in the historic preservation category, they do need to be a certified local government with the National Park Service, or a CLG, in good standing. The grant can be used to acquire and develop historical resources. Funding can be used to preserve or conserve the resource. Exhibits or ed educational panels can be created to interpret the resource in its history. There are also funds available for grantees to receive professional training about how to do any of the other project types. While Iowa Code does allow for grants up to $100,000, grants of that size are not practical for the current funding level. We recommend requesting no more than $50,000. However, a more typical grant request is $5,000 to $30,000. The grants do require matching funds. The grant match ratio varies depending on the type of applicant you are. The most favorable grant to match ratio is for nonprofits and governments at two to one. Half of the matching funds must be cash. The individual grant to match ratio is four to three. Two thirds of the matching funds must be cash. The for-profit grant to match ratio is one to one and three quarters of matching funds must be cash. Uh, now I wanted to take a look at each of the categories um, and uh, talk about some of the more specific project types in the documentary collection uh, category. Um, probably the most popular uh, project type would be um, microfilming newspapers um, as well as digitization. Um, processing collections, which would include um, maybe hiring an arch archivist to come in and um, go through a collection, provide order for it, and uh, create finding aids. Archival supplies to rehouse a collection that maybe is not in archival, archivally safe um, uh, boxes or folders. Oral histories, exhibitions, and uh, training. Here are some examples of successful HRDP applications in the documentary collections category. These are specifically for newspaper microfilming and digitization. The Norelius Community Library in Denison found a batch of German newspapers from 1911 to 1918 that had never been microfilmed. They were able to microfilm them to preserve them and digitize them for enhanced access to the collection. The Mount Pleasant Public Library microfilmed recent newspapers dating from 2013 to 2017. Buena Vista University was able to microfilm and digitize their college newspaper dating from 1892 to 2012. Moving on to the historic preservation category, um, some of the, these are a few of the most common project types um, in that category uh, would be to acquire, develop, and preserve real property. And these would be properties that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, survey historic and prehistoric sites nominate properties to the National Register of Historic Places, interpret historic properties or sites, and then training and education. The Lincoln County Historical Society has had two recent HRDP grants in the historic preservation category for work to rehabilitate the historic Douglas Mansion in Cedar Rapids. This building houses their museum. This more recent project included repair to, of the front porch, exterior masonry, roof, exterior trim, and windows. These photos highlight the porch repair. And uh, finally, these are some of the options for projects in the museum's category. Cataloging, conservation survey, treatment of collections, artifact acquisition and conservation, interpretation of collections, and exhibition. The Muscatine Art Center received funds for a first-person interpretation program that will introduce Muscatine County middle schoolers to Muscatine resident and Civil War soldier Daniel Parvin. Parvin's letters serve as the main source for scripts and classroom resources. The Hardin County Conservation Board received funds to purchase and install museum standard protective display cases for a newly donated archaeological collection of Native American artifacts and natural history specimens. And of course, we identify that not all projects can wait for our annual grant round. This is where the Emergency Historical Resource Development Program comes in. Annually, we set aside a limited amount of funding for emergency projects. These projects must address the stabilization of an imminently threatened historical resource. These grants are available in all three of the HRDP categories, documentary collection, historic preservation, and museum. If applying in the historic preservation category, the property does not need to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places 
but it does need to have an opinion of eligibility for listing on the National Register from the State Historic Preservation Office. These grant funds are replenished annually at the start of the state's fiscal year on July 1st. They are awarded to eligible projects on a first-come, first-served basis. While there isn't a deadline, the funds, especially in the historic preservation category, are typically expended quickly. 15,000 is the most that can be requested for an emergency project. Keep in mind that this amount may not be possible if there are limited funds remaining. If you are thinking about applying for an emergency grant, it is best to check in with me to see if there are fun funds remaining, and if so, how much. Emergency grants do require matching funds, and uh, those match ratios are the same as with our regular grants. Eligibility requirements are the same, um, as far as eligible applicants are the same as with our regular grants as well. The projects here need to be focused on emergency stabilization. These are not necessarily projects that will get a historical resource back to its previous condition. The grant will help stabilize the resource to prevent loss until you can raise funding to do additional work. The resource must be imminently threatened, and that threat cannot be due to deferred maintenance by the current owner. If a new owner has purchased a historical resource that needs immediate stabilization, ownership must have been taken in the 12 months prior to grant application. Two recent examples of emergency HRDP projects are a pair of neighboring buildings in McGregor after the town suffered a tornado two years ago. These buildings are owned by separate owners. Both applied and were successful in securing HRDP emergency funds to stabilize their buildings. The next program we're gonna talk about is the Country School Grant Program. This program was created in 1999 to address the loss of many of our state's one and two room school buildings. In the past 20 years, the program has provided funds for over 50 schoolhouse projects. These projects must involve work on buildings that were once one or two room schoolhouses. The projects should also include a component to educate the public about the country school. The grant can be used to acquire and develop a one or two room school building. Funding can be used to preserve the structure or conserve the artifacts held within the school building. Exhibits or educational panels can be created to interpret the school building and its history. There are also funds available for grantees to receive professional training about how to do any of the other project types. As mentioned earlier, the range of eligible applicants is inclusive of nearly anyone who has a country school building that they are responsible for maintaining. The applicant does not need to own the building, but must have the owner's permission to apply for the grant and as with the HRDP grant, if the applicant is a local government and applying in the historic preservation category, they do need to be a certified local government in good standing. The grant round follows the same timeline as the HRDP grant. Similarly, 50% of the grant funds are given at the beginning of the grant. The final half is available after successfully completing the project and approval of the grant final report. We set aside up to $25,000 for country school grants each year. The maximum grant request is $5,000. These grants require dollar for dollar match. Half of that match must be cash. The Shelby County Historical Society and Museum received a small grant to help purchase supplies and equipment that they needed to repaint their historic Jackson Schoolhouse. The Historical Society also partnered with the local 4-H to educate the young people in the program about historic preservation practices. The Heartland Museum Foundation in Wright County received a $5,000 grant to rehabilitate the Lake Township Number no. 6 schoolhouse. This schoolhouse is thought to be the birthplace of the 4-H emblem. Grant funding made it possible for the museum to create new displays, improve ADA accessibility, and integrate the historic school with the museum. The HRDP grants, uh, as well as the country school grants, do require that the work proposed meet professional standards. Applicants can benefit from technical assistance from professionals across the state through the field services program. These funds are set aside to provide technical assistance primarily to HRDP and country school grant applicants and grantees. We recently rebranded the program and it was formerly known as the Technical Advisory Network or TAN. It is available in all three HRDP grant categories. We attempt to pair projects with consultants with the correct expertise as near geographically to your organization as possible. The state will pay for the consultant's time up to 24 hours. 
This time is spent consulting on site, corresponding with the grantee, traveling, and preparing the final report that they share with both the grantee and the State Historical Society. As with the emergency funds, these funds are replenished annually at the beginning of the state's fiscal year and available until they are spent. Typically, these funds are expended by the end of the calendar year or shortly after. Again, with the eligible applicants, anyone who is eligible for HRDP funding is eligible for field services funds. A variety of expertise is available through the field services program. You can have an architect evaluate a historic building to provide guidance on priorities for that particular building and guidance on the required standards for historic preservation projects. Architectural historians and historians can prepare an Iowa site inventory form, which helps the grantee find out if their property might be eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, as well as provides uh, historic information for um, the state's uh, Iowa site inventory, um, which is an inventory of historic sites around the state. In the museums and documentary collections category, there are uh, museum professionals and archivists available to help evaluate collections. Consultants may help you understand best practices and professional standards as well as assist with policy development for your organization. All of the consultants can help you develop an HRDP project. However, they cannot write your grant application through the field services program. Now I would like to turn to the application and provide some grant writing tips and a walkthrough of the application. Before you begin an application, it can be very helpful to read through the entire application and make a quick list of items you will need to complete it. Some of those items may include your organization's tax ID and mission statement, basic application content, such as a description of the historical resource your application is focused on, budget information, including estimates from contractors or other vendors if needed, and attachments that, that may be needed, such as resumes, letters of support, photos, and the National Register nomination, if applicable. Making sure you have these items in advance will help the application process go more smoothly. Also, when you begin writing the application, you might want to consider writing the narrative responses in a Word document or a Google Doc. I find this to be helpful as it allows for you to quantify word and character counts to ensure your responses do not exceed the limits that are set by the application. It also can be helpful as it provides a backup of the application in case of technology issues. And it also provides an easy way to share the application with others who may need to review it. Now we would like to do a brief walkthrough of the application and uh, in the slide room uh, portal that, um, that houses our application. Uh, this will help you understand the mechanics of the application and hopefully address some of the frequent questions about the application. So when you go to the, uh, the website, iowahistory.slideroom.com, this will be the screen that comes up and you'll see a list of our available programs and then also at the bottom, you see our final report and payment request form. Um, since right now, um, our only open HRDP application would be our emergency one. This will be the one that uh, we'll take a, a look at. Actually, you don't need to log in or register with the site if you just want to kind of take a look at the, the different um, materials that are available. There's a guidance document both um, for the emergency program and for the regular uh, grant round which if you were applying for an emergency grant, you'd want to take a look at both of these. And then there are guides for each of the three individual categories. So whichever category you're looking at, you would need to uh, take a look at the guide for that category, as well as um, whichever guides up here would be applicable. The nice thing is that you can preview the application without logging in. Um, some of the questions don't show up if there are, you know, this line here where it says this question may have follow-up questions. That's something you're going to need to take a look at when you get into the application. But um, you certainly could get a, you know, print this off and get a head start kind of looking at um, what information you'll generally need to collect. Since I have a login, I'm going to go ahead and log in up here at the top. And there's an option over here to 
um, register if you haven't already, uh, don't already have a login. So when when you would log in, and you, if you haven't ever seen this before, you aren't going to have a section for in-progress applications. Um, you would probably need to click over to the directory, which would then have a list of all of the open um, grant applications. So we'll click on this one here. And I have actually started this and gone through it a little bit um, in preparation, but you'll see that there are three sections up here at the top. The first is forms, and those are all listed here along the left-hand side. So we'll just walk through um, each of these forms. Um, since this is the emergency grant, there are a couple of extra forms that we include just for the emergency program. Um, those won't show up if you were to apply in our regular round, but otherwise the applications, I believe, are identical. So um, we won't be missing anything that's in the regular, um, the regular application. So applicant information is basically information about the applicant, uh, the type of applicant. Uh, this would be that uh, we talked about certified local governments and uh, you would need to include verification that, um, it, and this is only if you're applying the historic preservation category and you are a local government, you need to get a, a letter from Paula Moore. Uh, to attach there, but this is basic contact information that you'd want to include. The nice thing about this program is that if you if you have previously completed an application, whether it was successful or unsuccessful, you can still go up here and copy your answers from a previous application that you filled out. So some of this contact information may not change from a previous application, so that's real handy to be able to do that since you might have applied the year before or started it, even if you've started an application the year before and didn't finish it, you can still pull those up if you've completed the form. The applicant profile includes the mission statements and then an applicant profile. Project officer information that would be your basic contact information for the person who's going to be the, the person that you want to have me contact if um, there are questions about the application or the project as it goes forward if you're funded. The authorized official would be um, whoever's legally authorized to enter into a contract for the organization or the government entity or you know, if it's a property owner, then that would be the property owner that could go there. The HRDP grant program category, this is one where there are some the questions change based on what you select here. So if you select documentary collections, you're gonna get some questions about digitization projects and whether your pro project would apply there. Historic preservation, we, would, we wanna know if it's a, a national historic landmark or a building that's uh, a property that's listed individually on the National Register of Historic Places, whether it's a contributing resource and a historic district that's listed on the National Register. It could also, if you're applying in the emergency round or uh, for a nomination, a National Register nomination project, it might be a property or district that has an opinion of eligibility for listing on the National Register. It could be a historic or a prehistoric site survey, or it could be a project that's um, focused on educating the public about historic preservation. And that might be like a workshop or something like that about a certain aspect of uh, preservation. So let's say you select it's a property that's listed. Um, we're gonna then ask for verification of, of that status. And um, I think going forward, we're going to look for a National Register nomination form to document that status of being listed on the National Register. If, if some of these other statuses, we might might check with us just what, what we would need to verify that. You'd need to provide a property name, historic name of the property if applicable, name of the historic district, address, and then location. And this is, you know, all this kind of information is, of course, stuff that, that you might want to, as Lisa mentioned, get prepared ahead of time and uh, just have that at hand when you're getting into the application. As, as we mentioned earlier, um, the applicant does not have to be the owner of the historical resource, um, but you do need to get permission from the owner if you're not. Um, and, and also your mission would need to be in line with um, preserving the historical resource. So if you, know, if you are the owner, it's easy, just 
select yes. If no, we have a form for you to download and have the owner sign off on that, and then you can reattach that down here. You just would choose, you know, bring up a, the dialog box here. We go from there. Um, one thing you probably notice here at the bottom is that it does say uh, changes saved. So as you're working in the application, it does save your progress as you go automatically. However, if you're at the bottom of the form and it does say save changes, there are times when it doesn't necessarily save as quick as you entered the information in. So you just could tap that save changes um, if that were to come up. You can also just proceed through the application either through the form list this on the left hand side or clicking continue to the next step. Here again is another one where the questions change based on what answer you select there. So in here would be where I could hit save changes just to show you how that works there. So this this is the where you're going to provide information about your project specifically the project title and the project summary. So with the project title this should be concise and informative rather than kind of clever or creative. Um, just basically, you know, tell us what, you know, what the resource is and what you're doing to it. You know, is it the Douglas Mansion porch repair or something like that. And then keep in mind um, to capitalize that as if it were like a book title or an article title, um, use proper um, capitalization in your project title. And then the project summary um, is going to be a, just a brief summary of the project, and this is something that we'll be using in our reports and press releases. So um, describe your project as you would want it um, to be seen publicly. Now the next form here is the project scope of work. And um, the way this is set up, you would you could uh, add your project element, and there you can add as many rows as you would like. You might have something like window repair. and um, that's really all that you need to put in that project element. And then the timeline, uh, rather than simply writing two weeks or four weeks, write something a little more um, specific, whether it's August to September 2020, or give us kind of a clear um, uh, date range. We're not going to hold you to that, those dates. But this helps our reviewers be able to see if you have the chronology correct for the order the project's going to take place. So let's say you have roof repair, window repair. We want to make sure that you're doing those in maybe a correct order um, so that you would have perhaps the roof done before the windows and uh, be able to see that you've thought that through. Also that you're allowing enough time to complete each step. And you know if you end up, you have only had four items that you needed to put in, you can just delete that last one, which we don't need it. And then the action steps, this is going to be a much more detailed. Um, we will, in, and you'll see here that we've allowed for 7,500 characters. So use that um, as a guide. And, um, and of course, as you type in this box, you'll see that the, the number here in, increases. So you will have an idea of how many characters um, are in your document here. But as Lisa suggested, it's not a bad idea to do these kind of narratives outside of, of a grant application form, just so you have it as a backup later um, in case you know you got it all typed in and for whatever reason continued to the next step and it didn't save automatically, you'll still have it in your Word document or your Google Doc that you could go back to. And um, and I've tested it, you can easily just copy and paste it over into this. But um, what we're looking for in this action steps is we want to know, we want each of these um, project elements to be referred to in the action steps. Explain what you're going to do with specific detail and why it's the right thing to do. Why does it, how does it meet professional standards for um, whether it's a historic preservation project or a documentary collection microfilming or digitization project. Tell us why. Um, why that's the right thing to do for your historical resource. Oh, so this is telling me you haven't you haven't completed something on this. You started a question and you didn't finish it. Or what you can do is instead of needing to fill it in anyway because you don't have the information right now, you can just continue anyway. 
and it'll just leave um, a little red exclamation point over here that you say, ah, I need to pay attention to that later. So if we're looking at the uh, budget form, it works a lot like the, um, the scope of work form that we were in. And you can add a row if you have more items here in the consultant section. And you certainly don't have to fill in something for each of these items. The um, consultants might be if you have an architect, the contractors might be like a window repair contractor. Personnel would be your organization's um, staff, um, and that can um, fit into the cash match section. However, we, we wouldn't want you to request funds for, um, for uh, permanent staff for your organization. Um, materials and supplies, equipment, and then other expenses, which might include things like mileage or something like that. You, uh, you will need to actually total um, each of the columns, so the grant request total, cash match total, and then in-kind match total. And we didn't really talk about in-kind match earlier, and that is um, any donated labor or donated goods for the project. Um, so you'll total each of those columns, and then you'll total this row over here in total project cost. Sometimes um, applicants can get confused about what we're looking for here with the expense description. So that should be just a, a text of what, what you're asking funds for for this line. So you might say window contractor, um, and then your next line might be an electrician or something along those lines, depending on what your project is, of course. Um, and then down at the bottom is the budget explanation. So this is a narrative where you can get into some more detail here and you can include you know, the fig how, how did you get to the figures you have in your budget table above? And you really should have items that you included up in the table above. Um, if it's based on, um, if you refer to a, um, an estimate you received from a contractor, um, you'll make note of that, but also include those figures in here and kind of what that was based on. And then uh, in the portfolio section that we'll look at in a moment, um, you'll include a, uh, copy of that estimate that you referred to in your budget narrative. So this section is um, for professional involvement. And this is a requirement in the historic preservation and the country school historic preservation category. These projects must involve a trained professional in a discipline appropriate to the project scope. So you will need to include contact information. So first we ask, is this a historic preservation category project? So yes. Like, no, you don't have to fill out anything more. However, I would say that if you have a project um, in either of the museums or documentary collections category where you involve a professional, you'll want to attach a CV or a resume in the portfolio section just so we do have an idea of so if you're um, bringing in a professional, you know, what their experience and background is. Um, but since it's required for historic preservation projects, you'll click yes, include their name, um, their title, um, if they have a business name, include that there, address, um, other contact information here. And then there's a letter of commitment, which would be um, a letter from the professional saying that they, they agree to, um, you know, oversee the project to make sure that it meets um, the professional standards, which for the historic preservation category, those would be the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation and guidelines for the treatment of historic property. We want to make sure that um, the person involved, um, then you would include their credentials here um, and, and add a file there that would show um, why they're qualified. Why do they meet the um, professional qualifications for somebody to work on a historic preservation project? And again, that would probably just be like a CV or resume. So moving on to the next step. Um, this is the minority impact statement, and this is something uh, that about 10 years ago was added to all state applications, uh, grant applications, so that um, applicants are uh, considering how their projects might um, uh, impact minority persons. So um, this is not something that you're scored on, but it is something that is part of um, the grant application. So if, if it has maybe possibly a disproportionate or unique positive impact on minority persons, you would select this and then um, indicate which group is in, impacted or add other, um, and then explain a rationale for why 
that impact is uh, anticipated. Um, otherwise, it could be a negative impact or um, with most of our uh, historical resource projects, it's usually they are not expected to have a disproportionate or unique impact on minority persons. So once you complete that, you would continue to the next step, and that is the portfolio. And this is where you're going to add primarily photographs is what um, is going to go here. There's a limit of 10 items. So if you anticipate that you have quite a number of photographs, you might consider putting uh, maybe four four photos in a PDF and then you know attach a you know a PDF document with your photos, and uh, then you could have a few more photos than 10 if, if needed. Because um, you're also going to attach your uh, budget, um, like contractor estimates or any sort of estimate, um, vendor estimates here, um, and any other relevant supporting documentation um, that you know, maybe shows you know, a reason for the project, that that's what you would want to add here. Once you add that, and again, easy to do, select files from your computer, once you've done that, I think you have to add a description or something along those lines. Once you have that all done, you'd click over to submit, and you can see that my application is not complete, so I can't actually submit it at this point. But ideally, you'd get to the point where you'd have green check marks on all of these, and it would allow you to preview and then hit um, the submit button. So that that's just a brief walkthrough of the application. One other item I did want to note is that we do have a scoring rubric that is what our reviewers use as they review and score the application. And um, that is something that's linked um, with the application. Um, so you're going to be able to pull that up and, and walk through each of those categories that they score on, which those categories are significant, project implementation, community impact, and budget. And um, it, it's a really helpful tool, I think, for you to be able to see what reviewers are looking at, um, looking for, and, and and go through your application and say, okay, am I answering these questions well enough to uh, get um, the, the the range would be zero to three is uh, what you're going to be looking at for each of those um, items on the the rubric. And so ask yourself, is, is this good enough to get a three in this category? So, so I really uh, encourage you to take a look at that rubric um, and see how your project um, might line up along, alongside those um, scoring criteria. And uh, finish up with some additional uh, guidance from Lisa. So a final tip I would add is to start your application early. It's important that you don't wait until the last minute to apply, so you give yourself plenty of time to get the information you need and to ask questions if you are unclear about what is being asked for in the application. It's also a very good idea to have at least one other person who is familiar with the project review your application. A second or third pair of eyes looking at the application can help catch typos or other mistakes that you may have missed. Also, someone looking at the application with fresh eyes may have suggestions for additional information to include that will ultimately strengthen your application. Thank you for your interest in the State Historical Society of Iowa's grant programs. If you have any questions or comments, you may reach out to me at the email or phone number provided on the screen. Thank you for your time, and we hope to hear from you about your future historical resource projects.